Bueno, yo quiero decir que estoy encantada de estar hoy aquí. Y como esto está en streaming, and this is part of this, the, this info week, I will go on in English. By the way, in your presentation you have said that I'm part of the Atlantic Council family. I'm a proud member of the executive committee of the Atlantic Council. And as such, I will uh, just then express my gratitude, the gratitude of the Atlantic Council to the uh, U.S. representation in uh, Brussels and to the U.S. Embassy here and to you, Benjamin Zeff, as representative. This is an important, extremely important moment, and this is an important, extremely important issue. And last but not least, my always, always a pleasure to come to Fundación del Pino. Fundación del Pino is, we owe to Fundación del Pino, and Vicente Montes has expressed a few of the highlights. We owe to Fundación del Pino a lot of what we know, and Fundación del Pino has become, well, the center to be connected to, to know what the intellectual life around the world is. Now, I would start by saying something which is obvious. Democratic values in this era of this information, this is my topic, democratic values in this era of this information, is a fitting way to begin this discussion of the Disinfo Week. For disinformation and representative democracy are inextricably linked. Democracy, liberal democracy, is predicted on citizens making informed choices. And core to the model is critical rationality. This is the model. By obscuring the truth, this information necessarily undermines that core requisite. And its most basic level, it impairs the ability of democratic society to function properly by replacing facts or faith in facts with rumors and conspiracy. At its most insidious, it accentuates divisions within society, making the common approaches, vision, and narrative needed to sustain mass democratic societies exceedingly difficult. In other words, this information represents an existential threat to liberal democracy. It is a threat that eats our society from within. And it is a threat that must be responded to. That is precisely the motivation behind this event of this, this information uh, week. And honestly, thank you. Thank you, my dear friend from the trenches, Dan Fred, for being the, I would say, the engine be, be, behind much of this effort, as behind so many of the efforts in the Atlantic Council. This is a clarion call that is now being taken up transatlantically. Here in Europe, we see interesting initiatives, though perhaps still more words than deeds. There is this commission's code of practice on disinformation. This, there is the EEAS, is Stratcom Task Force, and uh, this EU versus disinfo site in national legislation, we also have interesting approaches, but all these are first steps. And I'm sure that we will hear more from all the, the panel that comes. My remarks focus specifically on our democratic values and what is needed to preserve them. In a way, it goes a step beyond what Benjamin told us, this idea of vaccination, this idea of blindarse contra. We are just at the beginning of the war against disinformation. Of course, our moderator has said it, rumors and information warfare as well as propaganda have long existed, but current onslaught fueled by technology and social media represents at the very least a new phase, a new qualitative phase. Days by the steady stream of crisis this last decade and deeply shaken by manipulation since 2016, it is only now that policymakers and some of the public are finding their feet and recognizing the challenge ahead. Organizations such as Atlantic Council, such as 
Institute for Statecraft, Nicolas, are vital early actors, and NATO has been and will continue to be crucial given the natural linkage between disinformation and security. But we must be clear about the battle we face and how to address it. Disinformation is a cause of democratic deterioration, but it is also a symptom of a much deeper disease afflicting liberal democratic society. And responding to information warfare from Russia or for-profit progenitors of fake news in Macedonia is necessary but insufficient to address the challenge we face. I see here, and you will please excuse the facile uh, analogy, a cautionary parallel with the war on drugs. This is a trap that we must avoid. When confronted by an ominous danger, the knee jerk, the first reaction is always action, short term, immediate, visible action, interdiction and unmasking of conspirators, eradication of sources provide ample targets. And they can be summarized in action plans, tallied in reports and given budget lines. This is not to denigrate supply side, supply side policies. They are needed. But unless demand is also addressed, much like the war on drugs, we are in for a very, very long, maybe interminable war. The problem is that addressing demand is a much harder nut to crack. It certainly involves education, as we have heard. And the recent moves in many, and uh, Benjamin Ziff has uh, enunciated just to bring one example of a country that lately doesn't give us so many good examples is Italy, where there is where where there is a, a, uh, the introduction of uh, media literacy in curricula, and this is an interesting step. There are others, but we have to do more. We must address the idea of responsibility more deeply. This entails reconfiguring the citizen-state relationship. The key danger here is fragmentation, the debasement of citizenship. Today, the relationship between government and govern increasingly resembles that of a service provider, provider versus a consumer. As governance has gotten increasingly complex and technical, the citizen has been left behind. Even as government intrudes more and more in our lives, it creates a passive weak connection between citizen and state. It reduces a sense of responsibility and denies, denies agency. A disempowered population is fertile ground for those peddling disinformation. And as societal connections weaken or disappear, it is easy to fall into alternative realities, all of which is, of course, propelled by technology. This is this echo chambers that we know so much about. In Europe, we have to add a loss of narrative to that. With the end of the Cold War, and more recently with the end of the impulse for enlargement, Europe, the European project, in ever more heavily rested on prosperity as a leg legitimating basis. In the years post-crisis, this too has gone. The prosperity as legitimacy doesn't any longer work as the uh, narrative. Combined with the insecurity of an aging and shrinking population, there is a distinct sense of being adrift at sea in a global environment in which we feel lost and no longer in control. It is a witch's brew. None of this is any great epiphany, but it needs to be emphasized at the beginning of this discussion that we look at the threats coming from outside. Because even as we push forward responding to supply, we must be cognizant that we face a much greater challenge in healing the causes of demand within our society. The cancer of division and disunity has metastasized. Putting on sunscreen is no longer enough. This is urgent, not just because it impacts the proper functioning of our democratic societies, but because we are living in a world at a time of mutation. 
we are reaching the end of 200 years period in which the ideas of the enlightenment and the importance of the individual have been ascendant. The last seven decades of this period saw the growth of the world order based on liberal democratic ideas. Today, both liberal democracy and the ideals of the enlightenment are in retreat. The authoritarian and or illiberal democracies uh, model are more deeply uh, a societal perspective that privileges the collective above the individual. And they present a profound challenge to the liberal ideas that have defined our worldview. If we, and here I'm speaking for the US and Europe, along with our core partners, if we are to meet this challenge, we simply have to get our business, our affairs in order. We must create resilience with, within our societies. And I'm finishing. 72 years ago, the great American diplomat George Kennan published the very well-known The Source of Soviet Conduct in Foreign Affairs under the pseudonym X. The X article is, of course, remembered for establishing the intellectual foundations for that grandest of grand strategies, containment. Let's remember, is, however, how this article finishes. More important than containing the Soviet Union, Kennan said, was demonstrated, demonstrating resilience and vibrancy. And I quote, it is a question of the degree to which the United States can create among the peoples of the world generally the impression of a country which knows what it wants, which is coping successfully with the problems of its internal life and with the responsibilities of a world power, and which has a spiritual vitality capable of holding its own among the major ideological currents of the time. To avoid destruction, the United States need only measure up to its own best traditions and prove itself worthy of preservation as a great nation. This is a challenge before all of us here today on both sides of the Atlantic, finding a way to measure up to our own best traditions and to revitalize our liberal democratic basis. So even as we look at how to contain and respond to the challenges from without, let not forget or willfully ignore the challenges we face within. Thank you.